so bright. Spill. Okay. Hi. So we're gonna lighten up the mood a little bit. I don't have anything inspirational. We're actually gonna talk about tech because that's what I geek out about a lot. Uh, we're actually gonna bring back the blink tag, which is a terrible idea, but a hell of a lot of fun. So uh, we'll skip that part. Uh, so what do all of these have in common? There's a lot of them. Nobody? They are all JavaScript frameworks. And so uh, the, the, the only thing I had to do to come up with just the ones that are up here was look up JavaScript frameworks and look at the top 20 list and then filter through for the ones where I could find decent logos to actually stick up here. So there's a lot. And so the kind of joke of, you know, blink, there's a new one, blink, there's a new one, um, with JavaScript happens a lot. So there's a lot of churn and there's a lot of differences. And so that creates, especially if you're in the front end world, some interesting uh, issues just related to having to keep up with it or uh, moving to a new technology stack. So what we're going to look at is ways to kind of get around that. Don't worry, I don't, I don't have too, too much tech in here because I figured not everybody codes, so I didn't want to bore everybody with a whole bunch of code. But we will look at a little bit. When we look at the survey from last year, the Stack Overflow survey, we find that JavaScript is the number one language that people are coding in today, even past HTML and CSS. So that is uh, very, very popular, which is, um, I'm sure, partly why we have so many frameworks and so many flavors, because as we all know, we all agree on everything in terms of coders, right? <laughs> Tabs versus spaces, anybody? Let's start a little war, shall we? Yeah. So, but. <laughs> But oh, TypeScript versus JavaScript is another one. That's always fun. Um, I, I'm on the TypeScript team. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, but no, the so JavaScript is definitely uh, the num one of the number one things being coded in today. What's interesting though is the number one JavaScript framework is jQuery still. Oh. It is not so. As much as we talk about Angular, we talk about React, we talk about Vue. Those are kind of the heavy hitters today. Um, yeah, jQuery is still number one. So it's still totally worth knowing. Um, and it is still real. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, WordPress indeed. Um, so, but we're actually going to focus on React, Angular, and Vue simply because they are some of the more popular ones. And uh, they are uh, component based. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. But that is the ones we're going to focus on. So Angular, React, Vue, I'm going to use the, the, their logos um, to kind of make, keep track of where we're at and who we're talking about, but those are their logos. And I am using them in alphabetical order, not in order of preference. So, um, although I do work a lot in Angular, but I have cho chosen to put them in alphabetical order. Okay, so what are web components? That's something that we've been talking about a lot about in the industry. And what essentially they are is they're a reusable bit of component. There are reusable uh, bit of code. So for all of the uh, WordPress developers out there, uh, since we love to bash about, it's your widgets. Um, so it's those little things that we can drop and just reuse ad nauseum throughout our applications. The thing is, um, the other piece that they have is that they're encapsulated. And what that means is that they don't leak anything based on what the parent uh, what their parent page, if you will, is doing, uh, is doing. So they don't really care what's going on around them. What's going on around them doesn't really care about what's going on in them. They're kind of their isolated little black box that you can go boop. And so if you want to go ahead and have them interact with the parent, you can go ahead and add logic to them in order to specifically add that. But as a general rule, they're going to be their isolated little piece that doesn't really care at all about what's going on around it which is really cool because then you can have something that you can just reuse everywhere and know for a fact that it's going to do exactly what you expect. Th to create those web components, we use custom elements. So in React Angular Vue, you're going to create a component and that's the framework allows for doing that. I'm not going to go into great detail about how that's done, but you create your component plop. We can actually do that in JavaScript as well. So if you think of your HTML elements, if you've done any code, your paragraph tag, your blank tag, which we'll get back to in a second, um, those are all elements. And we can create our own. Um, 
And so if you look at how a component is done in Angular, React, and Vue, this is just a Hello World component. It's all it's going to do is print Hello World on the screen. You can see that there's some similarities, but they're not really exactly the same, right? You can't just take one and go and take a, a copy and paste a component that you wrote in Angular and just shove it in a React application and hope that it's going to work. It won't. I've tried. Um, so how do we get around that knowing that we may want, especially as front end people, I do a lot of front end, um, maybe have a UI library, right, where we say, okay, I have all of these components, I want all of my teams to be able to reuse so that they're saying the same across my company or my brand or whatever, uh, but I have a team over here that prefers React, I have a team over here that prefers Angular, and these guys are still using jQuery. How am I gonna handle like making sure that everybody can use these components. Because I really don't want to write them three times, four times, five times, depending on who decides to use what, right? Um, and then being able to, the maintainability of that is really, really difficult. So the two key features I still need, right, are that reusable and the encapsulated bit. Because I really want to make sure that if I give you a component and I make sure that that button is blue, I want it to stay blue. I don't care that your application, the rest is, you know, pink and purple or whatever. I want that component to stay put and I want the functionality of that component to stay the same regardless of where you plop it. That's really the big piece. And so this came along, the, the reason this entire even talk came along is because we, um, and Mike mentioned a little bit our application FlexiPark, right? We started it out in uh, AngularJS and then we moved over to Angular uh, as things progressed and as technology does. Um, and so it was like, well, it's kind of annoying to have to rewrite all of these components. How would we, if I had to do it all over again, how would I do that differently? And so and we ended up just going to Angular, and our company as a whole, we do a lot of Angular, so it was fine. But lo uh, looking back, what I would probably have done is actually gone ahead and made a lot of those components that we could plop in other places, simply because Hey, guess what, if Angular dies tomorrow, or if the next best thing comes out and we find that it's gonna work for the business better, now we have to go through all of that process all over again, versus if I had gone with just JavaScript-based components, we could have gone ahead and transposed those. The other reason we didn't do it is because at the time, the compatibility was So, you know, yeah. we'll talk a little bit more about compatibility in a minute. So can we do it? Yes, we can, and we're gonna talk a little bit about how that works. So the first piece is that uh, what we're going to use to do that is the document object model, otherwise the DOM. Have fun with those Google searches. Um, make sure to write HTML beforehand. Um, so what happens with the DOM is that essentially what it is, is it looks like all of those elements that are in your code and makes a nice little tree and allows you to go ahead and manipulate those dynamically through JavaScript or something else. Mostly through JavaScript. So if we look at like this about right here, which is right here, we can see we can track all the differences one to one from what's the code to the tree. And so this creates a tree of elements that we can then interact with. So that's what we're going to use to go ahead and create those components. And it's essentially what those um, JavaScript components are doing. Some of them are doing it directly with the way I use it or can be set to uh, do it directly the JavaScript way. Others use what's called an emulated DOM, which means they fake it. Um, because either when it came out, the, the technology wasn't quite there or their compatibility wasn't quite there or they're trying to make sure that they're going to be uh, able to work on things like IE, which is still a royal pain in the butt for this stuff. So. Yeah, so you can actually follow the model all the way down. You can follow each of the elements all the way down. So what happens with that is we have a root element, which is kind of the base of our document, and then all of its pieces. So how do we, but all of these pieces know about each other, right? We can walk the tree. They all know they can all interact with each other. In order to isolate it, what we use is a shadow DOM. And so what that does is it creates its own little kind of isolated black box, its own little piece of its universe, where we can go ahead and have another set of elements that doesn't know anything about what's going on out here. And so there's a little bit of vocabulary behind it where we have our shadow host, that's our custom element, that's where we're gonna rewrite the blink tag, that's that piece that we're gonna put in the HTML um, that says, hey, I want you to basically spit out this element. And then over here is everything it can do. 
and it's so it's all of the things that it's going to display, all of the functionality that it's going to be able to do, um, including styles, including JavaScript, and everything. And what's really cool is that whatever happens here, if I have some CSS that affects, say, all paragraph tags over here, and I have one in here, this will completely ignore it. It won't know about what's going on out here, and vice versa. If I have something that affects all paragraph tags or all paragraphs here, this piece won't know about it, and it won't affect what's happening over here. A uh, little bit more technical side of things, uh, when you're talking about IDs, so if an element has its own ID, same thing. You can have something with an ID of I don't know, foo, over here and one over here, and they won't know about each other and they won't interact, and it won't make all of your stuff blow up because now you don't, you know, you can't have two of the same uh, elements. So you can actually use IDs in these components and have 50 of them on a page. It won't matter, they won't know about each other, which is super cool. So let's bring back the blink tag. I keep on promising about the blink tag. Just so you know, this is a terrible idea. Don't do it. Um, it started out as a joke, and of course, jokes go too far. So everything I'm showing in terms of code, at the end I will flash uh, a URL where you can go find the code. There is an NPM package. You can go find the NPM package. Please don't use it in production. Um, it is a joke. It is not production ready. It should not be used in production. The blink tag is a bad idea. OK, good. <laughs> Uh, it's GPL licensed, so please go for it. Um, just so you know. Um, mm? <laughs> All right, so let's define our components, shall we? So a little bit of JavaScript. This is the code bit of this. I will go very fast through this for those who are code interested. For those who are not, this will be like five minutes, and we'll move on with our lives. But basically, the big thing is, and I'm using the whole ES6 syntax, we're going to have uh, the big important bits are we're going to define a shadow, and we're going to go ahead and attach a shadow of mode open. There's two modes you can use, open and closed. Uh, open allows the use of shadow root uh, to be able, you can do a dot shadow root from the DOM. Closed does not, it will return null if you go to go find a shadow root. So if you're talking about like giving another team or something that you might want, you know, some other entity, outside entity, you probably want to have it closed. I left it open because it's an example and it makes life easier. But that's really the only difference between the two. Um, and then you're going to go ahead and define it. Now notice how I had to make it app blink and I couldn't just make it blink. And so the reason for that is all custom elements need to have at least one dash in them in their name that differentiates them from the normal HTML elements that are out there that do not have dashes. You can have as many dashes as you want, but I couldn't just recreate blink. I had to call it at blink. I could have called it whatever I want, but it needs to have a dash. It will not work otherwise. Um, the next bit is we go ahead and do a bunch of JavaScripty things to add all of our nodes inside of it. Um, and then the big thing that I always forget, you actually have to append it to our shadow, which means you have to actually attach it to the shadow, otherwise things don't show up, imagine that. Uh, but in that order does matter because JavaScript, right? So if you put a, whatever order you put it in, that's the order your nodes are going to show up. That's the order in which your elements are going to show up. Then we add some CSS to make it blink, uh, all the fun stuff. There's two ways we can do that. You can put it directly in your JavaScript, which I personally abhor. Um, that's up to you whether you like it or not. I personally do not. So the, um, the other way you can do it, so over here I have it, and then we can just add the class and append again. Or the other way you can do it is to go ahead and append, um, and I think I show it in the next slide, is to go ahead and just add it as a uh, import, a CSS import, and then you can have it in your CSS file somewhere where it actually belongs. Uh, I only blink things three times. This code that I'm showing would make it blink ad nauseum forever, but I know some people really don't like that, so, and I don't want to make anybody even more seasick than anybody might already be, so we're only blinking three times and done with. So yeah, that's the, that's the CSS import that I was just talking about, and that way all of this can go away in its own little file, and that way you can keep your styling and your functionality nice and separated. It's a lot nicer, at least in my opinion. So now we have this cool thing. We have an app blink, we pass it some hello world text, and yeah, we have a thingy that blinks. It's awesome. But the thing about the blink tag is it didn't just blink text, and it really didn't work that way. We actually, with the blink tag, we would put information over here, and we could blink the entire page if we wanted to, right? So we can actually do that. And the way we do that is through slots. 
And slots are essentially a placeholder that takes a bunch of information and just plops it in. Um, and the big thing with slots is that the parent actually controls the sl what is in the slot. So it's kind of like this sneaky little thing you can in inject right in there. Um, but the parent actually gets to not only control the functionality of what's in the slot, but the styles that are in the slot and all of that fun stuff. So there's a little bit of interaction there. You got to watch what you want to allow people to actually put in those slots. Those slots are named, so you can have multiple slots and you can choose in which order they go. So if you have, say, a card, you want to do a card type of system with a title, a body, and a footer, for example, you can totally do that and name them. Or you can have, you know, multiples of the same name so that you can, like, make a list, for example. It's kind of up to you how you want to do that, but that's what they do. And they have their own markup. So it's super simple. You create your slot, you give it a name, and you attach it. And there you go. You've got your placeholder, and you can do this as many times as you need for as many slots as you need. So now what I can do is I can say, I have an element, my blink. I want to open my slot. This div is actually going to go away. So you could have put it on any element whatsoever. You could have put it on a span of whatever. This div never actually shows up. And then you have the content. I'm still going to do a hello world. And we're going to go ahead and yay, we blink. So if you look at the output inside of your DOM in terms of your HTML, you have your div and your junk. It's super cool. And all of it, all it's going to show and expose to the parent is this, which is really cool. <laughs> compatibility. <laughs> um, so compatibility, can we actually use this stuff? Because historically, the idea was, yes, we have JavaScript components. They're super cool, but nobody can use them because the browsers haven't implemented any, implemented the functionality yet. Well. According to Can I Use, one of my favorite websites in the world, um, you can, especially if you're using some of the uh, more modern browsers, so your Firefox, your Chrome. Safari still has some issues, but it's related to uh, the CSS, um, so that's not near as big of a deal. Most of the functionality is there. Chrome, of course, our favorite, um, I mean, IE, I mean, our favorite does not uh, support it. However, there is a polyfill. So you can actually make it work. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 just make sure you've got the right polyfills to do whatever you need. You're probably gonna, if you're supporting IE, you've probably got a slew of them already anyway. So make sure you're adding the right polyfill. But there is a polyfill that exists. I have never tried to use it, so I can't vouch for how good or how complete that functionality is. So we can actually use it. And so how do we use it? Well, we can package our code up. Uh, basically, what we're going to do, and the little bit of difference is here, the way I ended up doing it is I went ahead and made it a self-contained function that automatically goes ahead and run itself, and I export it using the new C, uh, JavaScript modules. Um, kind of a note, this JavaScript code would, uh, would not actually work in IE anyway. You'd have to probably use something like Babel to compile it down to something that IE could actually read. Uh, but cro for example, Chrome, Firefox, they read it just fine. Um, so you're going to export your module. Um, I put it in a barrel to make it easier to import. Because Blink was kind of lonely, I went ahead and re-implemented Marquee to go with it. I mean, if you're going to commit, you might as well commit all the way to the end, right? Um, so we do have Marquee. And uh, then we can go ahead and import it. So just to prove that it works, I just have a plain old vanilla JavaScript and HTML CSS. Um, the thing is, you get this nasty little error once you start <laughs> importing it. And that is, uh, and all of these are done in Chrome. Uh, Chrome tells you, yeah, you're blocked by cores. The way you get around it is you actually run it on uh, some kind of uh, local server. Uh, so pick your poison on that one. But you actually have to run it. Uh, so you can see I'm running it on 8080, but I don't even remember which one I used. But you get the idea. So that's how you get around that beautiful little error. Um, let's look at the others. Let's go back. Our nice little friend, Angular which apparently that slide is not liking me. Uh, but basically, what you have is you just do a normal JavaScript import. Uh, you can either do it by module or just the import. It goes ahead and automatically works. I go ahead and you can see I have my blink and my slot. For the library, I called it RetroBlink. It took me longer to find a name that I could use for uh, NPM than it took me to actually write the code. Um, thank you for that, JavaScript community. React, same idea. You do a nice little import. I mean, you guys are getting the idea. You import the thing, and it just works. And just to prove, we, uh, it also works in view. 
And that is what I got for you guys today. Here are the, the code. So they have the GitHub repo if you would like to pull request something ridiculous on the already ridiculous <laughs> repo. And uh, the NPM, uh, which please don't use in production. And that's what I have for you guys today. <coughs>